I'm Heather D'Angelo, editor of Now.Space, and I'm here at the Space 2.0 Summit in San Jose to find out how the commercial space industry plans to bring us back to the moon and beyond. I'm about to meet up with Charles Miller, the president of NextGen Space LLC, a company that works with NASA to figure out how to make the fantasy of science fiction real. Charles has a plan to get us back to the moon in only about five years. Let's find out more. Hi, thanks for meeting with me. Hi, Heather. I wanted to talk to you today about this 103-page proposal that you wrote with NASA that details how we will visit the moon in five to seven years, and then 10 years after that, possibly put a human settlement, permanent one, on the moon. What motivated you to write this? Because it's pretty ambitious. And did you watch a lot of Star Trek as a kid? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I love Star Trek. Let me do that first. Okay. So I absolutely watched I a tell. lot of Star Trek, <laughs> and uh, I'm actually a, a next generation guy. So me that's too. my favorite of the th of okay. the three. What motivated me is that I saw this was possible. There's a revolution going on with in commercial space, and the future is going to be opened up in space by leveraging the power of free enterprise and the strength of government. Free enterprise is not good at long term planning and and doesn't like to take long term risks. Governments can do that. Government is not good at lowering costs, you know, driving and accelerating innovation, but private enterprise is the best of that. And if you can marry the two of them together, you can get some magic. And so what this study showed, funded by NASA, with a bunch of former NASA you know, engineers and, and senior managers, is that we could get back to the moon by the end of the, the second term of the next president. We could set up a permanent settlement on the moon, and the commercial focus would be mining the resources of the moon to open up the solar system. So for those who want to go to Mars, this isn't about moon or Mars. You can mine the resources of the moon to help get to Mars a lot cheaper. Why a permanent settlement rather than what we do with the International Space Station, which is to have a rotating crew? So our idea is you go there for six months tours, and every six months you swap out the astronauts to the moon. So you have a permanent base where you have astronauts from many nations on the moon, similar to what we do at the space station, but at the moon, and you're mining the resources of the moon. Okay, so we're not talking about like your average Joe going there and living on the moon. We're talking about a rotating well, crew of astronauts. So what we did show in the study is what the cost for the average Joe would to, to get a trip to, to sit on the moon. And so if average Joe has $200 million in discretionary funding in their pocket, they could take a trip to the moon. And over time, we think of the natural evolution, which we didn't look at, is like how many of them decide to stay. Maybe they'd want to go there to stay. To, yes. To like stay and Absolutely. live on the moon. <laughs> so yes, we think there are people who would like to do that. Are we there? Can, yes. They want to live on the moon. Yes. You would have a huge number of people said they would love to go to the moon to try to stay. We're just getting the results in from Scott Kelly's year in space. Yeah. And he has listed some pretty intense physiological issues such as increased cancer risk and heart strain due to right. blood redistribution right. and also he mentioned a psychological stress that he said is harder to quantify and yet perhaps is damaging. Right. What do you think like future lunar citizens or even crew could do to mitigate these health risks? First of all, the, the research that NASA is doing to the International Space Station is critical. We need to understand all the issues and the risks, so that's great but I think they can all be overcome. The key issue is that you understand the risks and mm -hmm. you're willing to take the risk in spite of this to be part of something bigger than yourself. Living on the frontier is going to be stressful and how we learn to live and overcome those stresses of, uh, of the risk of being on the frontier, I think some people will be inspired to be part of that. So you've said that achieving the goal of settling the moon opens up the solar system to you know, achieving other things with space exploration or settling the Mars. When you dream big about this right. kind of thing, right. what are you thinking? I see us as the harbinger of taking life throughout the solar system and into the universe. The universe is dead as far as we know. We would be part of taking life and humanity as a subset of all life into the solar system. That is, to me, an amazing thing to be part of. I'm focused on the moon right now because it's the easiest achievable next step that you can start driving economic growth and benefits to people here on Earth. Opening up the solar system, the resources of space, is one way of protecting planet Earth. 
the resources of the solar system can help us protect the environment. Well, we had nearly virtually unlimited clean solar power from space solar power. You could take the dirty environmental polluting industries that we need and you could actually, over the long term, move some of those off the planet. You could use the resources of these rare earth metals that we're mining all over the planet and polluting rivers. Mm -hmm. A lot of those metals are available in abundance off the planet. Mm -hmm. So if we have a more holistic view of our place in the universe, mm -hmm. we can help solve these bigger problems. So in your lifetime, the space industry has been blown open from being just the very exclusive domain of the government to now this much more inclusive thing where space exploration is kind of possible to anyone. Did you ever think that would be possible? I always was living in that possibility and uh, have struggled over my career of how do we overcome this resignation and cynicism about all we have is some big government program that's too expensive. And now we're seeing the breakthrough where the, these possibilities are coming back. And in fact, I only think we've just seen the beginning of this. I don't think people really understood what Jeff Bezos at Blue Origin yeah. and Elon Musk at SpaceX and maybe Paul Allen at uh, Vulcan Aerospace are really going. They're going to build space planes that are totally reusable and instead of thousands of dollars a pound, you're going to be talking hundreds of dollars a pound or less to go to space. And instead of flights per month, you're going to have how many flights per day we're going to space. That's what's coming. When is that coming? That's coming. <laughs> it's, it's, it's much sooner. We're going to see it. I think we're going to see it in the next decade. And I don't think people really understand uh, really that it makes what we've seen in the last 10 years to be small. That's really exciting. And so, so many people are into space right now, and I'm sure you meet a lot of them. Yep. <laughs> when people ask you, you know, how can I get involved in this? How can I be part of this, you know, revolution? Right. What do you say to them? When we open up space as a frontier to everybody, we're going to need business people. We're going to need artists. We're going to need writers. We're going to need storytellers. It's not just all about the engineers. When you build communities in space, you're going to need all of the above. Build your strength in the areas that you're, you're strongest at because that's what you'll get known for and there's a place for you in the space community to be part of this bigger, grander adventure. I like that. There's a so. place for everyone in the space community.